$16 trillion was um, spent in the US um, uh, during 2010 on cancer. So it has a huge impact. Uh, when we want to talk about the most common cancers or the most deadly cancers, it really differs from um, men to women to children, right? But overall, the most common ones tend to be uh, lung cancer, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and then prostate cancer. And the most deadly ones, um, number one most deadly one is almost always lung cancer, uh, followed by colorectal and then, you know, gastric, liver, and breast cancer. I just want to say real quick here that um, we don't usually consider, sorry, we don't usually consider skin cancers um, in these statistics because they have a much less mortality rate. And so um, we exclude them as, uh, as one of the most common cancers. However, they are incredibly common. So now that we've talked about, you know, how costly and devastating cancer is, let's talk about cancer burden and how we can reduce it. Well, there's a study that mentions that up to 50% of current cancers can be prevented by avoiding risk factors. And so um, one perfect example is that if a person is vaccinated against the human papillomavirus or the hepatitis B virus, this can prevent up to a million cases of cancer per year. And so as you can see in this table right over here, um, avoiding risk factors and then um, abiding by early detection and screening can all reduce the cancer burden. And of course, effective treatment is really important, but at the end of the day, effective treatment is when you know, you're a step too late. So ideally we'd want to detect it before we have to treat it because that makes everything easier for us. So moving on. Um, so according to the WHO, the World Health Organization, there are five um, leading cancer risk factors. Um, the first of which is a elevated BMI. So, you know, being overweight or obese or being physically inactive, right? Also having an unhealthy diet, you know, high in fats and low in fruits and vegetables and fibers. Um, also uh, the use of alcohol. But most importantly, the single most, sorry, the single most important risk factor for cancer is tobacco smoking. Um, according to one study, 22% of cancer related deaths can be attributed to cigarette smoking only. So, um, you know, smoking cessation or to stop smoking is just an easy way to reduce the risk, risks of cancer. Of course, there are other risk factors other than the five I've just mentioned, including advanced age, because the rate of, at which mutations occur tend to increase with age, a family history of cancer or a genetic predisposition, as Dua has mentioned, hereditary or familial or genetic predispositions, the exposure to carcinogens or oncogenic microbes. Uh, we're going to be going into this um, shortly, right? Uh, what are carcinogens and what are oncogenic microbes? And then the presence of chronic inflammation, because inflammation is just, you know, it's just this unfavorable environment for the normal cells and it affects the rate at which cells um, produce normally. And then of course, immunosuppression, um, which we'll be giving an example uh, later on. Radiation is also very important, either the ionizing radiation that comes from, you know, the sunlight, uh, sorry, the non-ionizing radiation that comes from the sunlight or the ionizing radiation from, um, you know, x-rays and stuff. And then finally, hormones. Yeah, hormones actually um, can increase the patient's risk for cancer, especially um, one example can be in the endometrial cancer. Uh, very high levels of estrogen can actually increase the patient's risk of uh, endometrial cancer because it causes the endometrial cells to reproduce, reproduce, reproduce. And the more you reproduce, the more likely you are to create a gene mutation or an error that can increase the risk for cancer. So um, I've, I've taken this table to just show you what are carcinogens. Carcinogens is just like a fancy term. It just refers to any substance that induces the formation of cancer. So usually it leads to a mutation and this mutation leads to cancer. Um, the most important thing regarding this table is um, I want you to look at how cigarette smoking is associated with so many cancers, 
right? So first you smoke the cigarette, so that's damaging to your esophagus, to your uh, larynx and to your lungs, of course, but also the cigarette gets metabolized into other toxic byproducts and that affects the bladder, this affects the cervix and this even affects the kidney. So places you don't really expect cigarette smoke to go to in the end, right? Um, also, I wanna here mention um, oncogenic microbes. So these are microbes that have the potential to cause cancer. We can see here one example is the Epstein-Barr virus or EBV, and it's related with many lymphomas. So many lymphomas are associated with Epstein-Barr virus. Um, also, hepatitis C virus is a major cause of hepatocellular carcinoma. In fact, recently, hepatitis C infection has become the number one overall cause of hepatocellular carcinoma. It's even more um, prevalent than alcohol as a cause. And we already talked about um, you know, ionizing radiation and non-ionizing radiation, how they can damage the DNA. So now let's talk about screening. Screening is like one of my favorite topics. Um, there's this misconception that screening is done to people who have signs and symptoms. This is incorrect because by definition, screening is done to people that are healthy. They're healthy, just like you and me, but they meet the criteria for screening. So it discovers the disease before it becomes um, symptomatic, right? It, it follows the guideline of early detection equals increased survival. And it's done to many cancers, most notably these four, which we're going to be discussing over here. Um, so this might look a little bit like a complicated table. I'm sorry, but we'll go through it together. Um, for lung cancer screening, uh, if a patient is between the ages of 55 to 80 and they are a heavy smoker, right? Then starting the age of 55, they should, go, uh, they should undergo a low dose CT once per year. Once per year, whether they have symptoms or no symptoms, um, they can undergo um, a, lo a low dose CT that can help us detect lung cancer early. The second example here is cervical cancer. And I just wanna say one thing real quick. Um, cervical cancer is a vaccine preventable disease. So um, if you are between the ages of nine to 26, which I'm sure many of us are, um, it's advisable to take the cervical cancer, the HPV vaccine for both men and women, right? Uh, especially women, but also men, right? And so um, how do we screen for cervical cancer? Screening for cervical cancer starts at the age of 21, at the age of 21, we start doing pap smears every three years. So when you go to your gynecologist, they'll ask you about a pap smear, and then you'll do one every three years. And then after the age of 30, um, the risk for cervical cancer increases even further. So now we have to do something called a co-test. So a co-test, which means two tests, is the pap smear, just like you did when you were 21, and a HPV DNA vaccine, just to detect the types of DNA that have not yet caused any changes um, in the pap smear. So this is done every five years rather than three years because it's more reassuring. And this should be done to all women above the age of 21. Breast cancer, I'm sure this is the most famous, many of you guys have heard of it. The mammogram, mammograms are really, really important, you guys. Uh, most commonly, mammography starts at the age of 50. Um, some societies say we should um, do it one, once per year. Other societies say once every two years. So, um, you know, it's debatable, but either way, uh, starting the age of 40 to 50, you start doing mammograms um, every one to two years uh, to detect the slightest change before it becomes a lump or before it becomes symptomatic. And then finally, so we can finish with this long table, um, colon cancer. Everybody at average risk, so anyone like, for example, um, like maybe some of our parents, they should start doing a colonoscopy at the age of 50, right? And um, this colonoscopy, there are many replacements like something called a sigmoidoscopy or a fecal occult blood test, but the gold standard for screening, the one that can most reliably rule out cancer is colonoscopy. If they undergo the colonoscopy at age 50 and, and the colonoscopy comes out clean, they will have to repeat it only 10 years after. So if you do it at 50, you're, you're going to be very well rested for the next 10, day, 10 years, I hope. 
I hope you guys that um, this table, you will go to your loved ones, the elderly around us and to advise them to go and screen because this is a great way to help prevent disease. So I just wanted to add some remarks here about screening. Uh, number one, screening can be individualized, right? So it's not always, for example, every 10 years. So for example, uh, if, if I have a elder brother and my elder brother had colon cancer at the age of 40, then I should start colon cancer screening at the age of 40 as well. I cannot start at 50 now, I should start at 40 because I am at higher risk. And this is what we mean, it's individualized to, to other patients. And also, as I said, um, as I said earlier, receiving the HPV vaccine is wonderful. If you do, if you take the vaccine, great job. But it does not mean I'm immune now. I will never take the uh, Pap smear or anything because um, there are certain subtypes that the vaccine does not cover. Right? The vaccine helps us become more immune, but it does not eliminate the risk. Um, some people might be thinking to themselves, uh, okay, so why don't we create a screening program for every single cancer? That way we'll be immune to every single cancer. The problem with that is that screening can be costly. It can be costly in terms of money or in terms of, you know, the emotional impact. When I'm sure that every woman or many women are scared before they go into the mammogram. So this is the elements that are factored into a screening program. How common is the cancer? How much does it cost to screen it? How sensitive and specific is the screening modality? And other many complicated factors. That's why we only do them for you know, certain kinds of cancers. And then finally, you guys might be, um, some of you might be wondering why we haven't added um, prostate cancer into the list of uh, screenable cancers. And that's because screening for prostate cancers, it's, it's a little bit of a controversial topic. So physicians or doctors have decided to individualize the screening of prostate cancer according to the patient. If I, the doctor, notice that my patient might be at increased risk for prostate cancer. Maybe his dad or his elder brother or something had prostate cancer. Okay, I can perform screening, but it doesn't mean I have to do it to every single patient. Uh, screening, by the way, for prostate cancer is done through a digital rectal examination and something called a PSA measurement. So I check the blood for a hormone called, called PSA. Um, I think this is my last slide, and I just wanted to show you guys that screening works. We should all be performing screening at the right time. Um, this blue line that shows the incidence or the number of cases, the number of new cases of cervical cancer, early stage cervical cancer. And you can see at the year 19, let's say 75, this was the number. And then after screening started, it was dipping down. And so this is why cervical cancer is not as common as it used to be. So screening works. Um, we should all be advising ourselves and our loved ones to screen, especially for the prevalent cancers. All right, so now on to my question. Um, here we go. Question number one, which of the following is the most important risk factor in the development of cancer? Is it A, alcohol, B, obesity, C, smoking, or D, advanced age? Could we put on the poll, please? All right, I wonder if it was too easy of a question. All right, let's give maybe five or 10 more seconds and then end the poll. All right, perfect. Um, I'm gonna end the poll right now. Whoops, sorry. So uh, yes, as everybody has uh, correctly guessed or most people have correctly guessed, smoking, sorry, smoking, is the most important risk factor for the development of cancer. It uh, leads to the most mutations and it's also one of the most common factors and it has the strongest causal relationship with cancer. 
So um, this is a great take home message from this lecture. Now on to the second question, whoops, for, to the second question, which of the following statements is the most accurate regarding screening? Is it A, men and women over the age of 60 should undergo screening colonoscopy? Is it B, cervical cancer screening should be delayed if a woman received the vaccine, the human papilloma vaccine? Is it C, screening for lung cancer is done regardless of the patient's smoking history? Or is it D, the benefits of undergoing screening mammography almost always outweighs the risk of radiation that the patient will be exposed to? So let's give like five seconds and then launch the poll so people can read it. Maybe it's a bit of a long question. All right, maybe could you please launch the poll? Thank you. All right, maybe we can discuss it in like five to 10 seconds. All right, thank you everybody for answering. So um, let's discuss it right now. Um, so for colonoscopy, colonoscopy, as you guys remember, should be started at the age of 50 for people at average risk. And we mentioned a lot in this uh, lecture that the vaccine is good, but it does not eliminate the risk. Whether you have or you don't have the vaccine, you should still undergo pap smears. Um, screening for lung cancer is actually done to those um, who smoke heavily even, not only like light smoking, but heavy smoking. Not everybody has to be screened for lung cancer. And then finally, um, the answer here is D, which is that you know um, the radiation of a mammogram is actually much less than you think. Um, there's a study that says that the mammogram is equivalent to like seven weeks of natural radiation that's around us, you know? So it's actually like this misconception, people think that mammograms are really bad because of the radiation they offer, but the benefits of mammograms greatly, greatly outweigh the harm that they provide, which is, you know, minimal harm. They provide minimal harm. All right, everybody, thank you so much for listening. Feel free to follow us on Instagram and YouTube. And I hope um, you have benefited from this lecture. I will leave you now. If you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, you guys can enjoy a short break.